We are now going to cover Unit 8, Transport, Luggage and Parcels. Two outcomes in this unit. Know the driver responsibilities in relation to accepting, loading and transporting parcels and luggage. The second outcome, know how to carry out lost property checks and take the appropriate steps to contact the rightful owner. Outcome 1. Know the driver's responsibilities in relation to accepting, loading and transporting parcels and luggage. We're going to talk about insurance and obviously your duty of care, risk assessment and special precautions. You as a driver and representing your company, an ambassador of your company can provide a unique, bespoke and valued service to customers who have a variety of goods and luggage that require to be transported safely and efficiently. So, as a taxi or private hire driver, you have a duty of care transporting customers' property. All luggage, therefore, must be safely secured and not liable to weight transfer. So secure the luggage in your boot via straps to make sure it does not move about in the boot, which could obviously damage the luggage or even damage your vehicle and cause steering problems if it's particularly heavy weights. They must be free from stress, e.g. impact, crush and piercing. This is particularly uh, prone when it's people shopping. You do not put the light items at the bottom and the heavy items on the top. For instance, you would not put a crate of beer on top of a loaf of bread. I know this sounds fairly obvious, but spread out evenly everything in the boot uh, so that it doesn't topple or fall over when cornering. And again, it's not subject to weight transfer, moving around in the boot. It must be insured against damage and loss. It must be protected from the weather. So should your licensing authority allow roof racks or trailers, it has to be totally enclosed. It must be out of sight from the seat, sneak thief. Most theft is opportunist. If you need to leave something on display, it's an opportunity for a thief to either put your windows through to grab the item, try the doors, etc. Should you have to leave something in your car, make sure it is locked out of sight in the boot. Do not leave anything on display. You have a duty of care to make sure nothing is lost, damaged or stolen. Your taxi plate or your private hire plate it lists the number of persons you are licensed to carry. That also indicates you should be able to carry four regular size suitcases. There's got to be adequate luggage provision sufficient for the number of persons for which the vehicle is licensed. If you want to protect your customer's luggage and property to ensure that you're not liable for damage, theft or negligence, you may have to take out professional indemnity insurance. This is for the operator. It protects the business against compensation brought by the client if mistakes have been made or you're found to be negligent in some of all the service that you provide for them, i.e. carrying of goods in this instance. As a taxi or a, or a hackney driver, you may wish to take out a personal indemnity insurance. If an operator is employing staff, you will need employer's liability insurance. Also, uh, he will need public liability insurance for the likes of yourself who are self-employed visiting the premises and also the public who may visit the premises. To go over this once more, you need private hire insurance for private hire drivers and public hire insurance for taxi or hackney drivers. Both of these cover hire and reward. You could have a monthly instalment plan and earn up to 60% no claims bonus. You may have to increase your public liability insurance for school contracts, social services, hospital contracts, corporate accounts or council contracts. You may want to take out fleet insurance if you own more than five vehicles. Uh, I would recommend obviously comprehensive. 
and you may want to take out personal accident insurance. It's useful if you're injured due to a collision or a crime of violence and off work due, uh, due to that and not able to uh, draw any income. Self-employed drivers, private hire drivers, I beg your pardon, are under contract to the operator will normally be insured via that contract which exists between the operator and the hirer, the customer. So, because the driver is acting on behalf of the operator, this would be commonly known as vicarious liability. Therefore, any initial claim is made against the operator's insurance by the customer, not against the driver. But please be aware, a counterclaim can be made by the operator against the driver if that driver is deemed to have been negligent. So if he's lost people's goods due to his negligence or damaged his goods or had goods stolen due to negligence, a counterclaim can be made by the operator against the driver. So customer's cop, uh, property must be kept secure at all times. You have that duty of care. Theft can occur when you leave your vehicle unlocked, obviously, and a would-be thief comes along and tries the door. If passengers take advantage of multi-luggage or drop-off situations, you may have a hotel contract going to, the, going to see the airport or coming from the airport where the passengers don't actually know each other. And one passenger takes advantage of a situation by taking someone else's luggage. Theft can occur at unguarded situations. Airports are similar places where there's people milling around, busy, busy spots near the rear of the vehicle. Should you be taking luggage out, don't leave your vehicle unattended or unlocked. And obviously, as I've already mentioned, a sneak thief, an opportunist thief, is tempted by luggage or any items that have been left in full view. Let's go back to weight transfer. All goods are subject to weight transfer during braking, acceleration, and especially cornering. They should be secured and stored in a manner that prevents any excess movement. So position any heavy items against the vehicle's rigid panels and backrests. Carefully maneuver luggage into a locking position to prevent any movement during the journey. You can do this by one suitcase supporting another or strapping suitcases and luggage in against the backrests. You must take into account the size, capacity, volume, and especially the weight. Should your licensing authority allow you to have a trailer, it needs to be properly um, loaded so that there is no weight transfer within the trailer and also be protected from the weather. For school contract vehicles, including minibuses, storage place must be made available for people's books, sports equipment, and, and occasionally musical instruments for any after school activities. All aisles and exits must be kept clear so that in an emergency, there's quick and unimpeded access to safety. The children can get out of the vehicle quickly and safely. Drivers and their escorts on school contracts should ensure that no luggage presents an overhead danger or can be projected forward in the event of an emergency stop. So, make sure the school children or any passengers for that matter do not put anything on what is inadvertently called the parcel shelf. It is not a parcel shelf. A, as I said, the item can be projected forward in the event of an emergency stop. And also, it restricts the rear vision of the driver from his rear view mirror. All hand luggage and valuables must be placed in a safe and secure area where it's hidden from view. Should you have an estate car, you may want to install a screen to stop anything coming in from the rear. So screens, guards, straps, etc., all assist in securing luggage. Labels on people's luggage will help prevent theft or someone taking advantage in a multi-luggage drop-off situation. I've already said, don't leave anything on display. Don't leave anything in your vehicle overnight. 
drivers should ensure that any money and valuables such as cash, mobiles, PDAs are kept secure and hidden from you. When you leave your vehicle after the end of your shift, take any cash, your mobile phone, or your PDA if it's a separate unit into your home with you. Do not leave float cash on view. There's a caption there, which is a cutting from a local newspaper in Lancashire. Taxi drivers have been warned against leaving cash in their cabs after the spate of breakings. Police have recorded five incidents recently of float cash being stolen from cars left overnight in Nelson and Briarfield. Do not leave any cash in your car. It is temptation for a would-be thief. Officers have now begun to, a campaign to stamp out the problem and have visited taxi offices throughout the area to give advice on crime prevention. They've also introduced plainclothes police officers monitoring hotspot areas to try and catch thieves actually in the act. School children especially may be prone to leaving items behind. So when completing a school run or final drop off, a driver should always check his vehicle for any forgotten items or other luggage. And with labeling, drivers should also ensure that a passenger is given his or her personal luggage and asked to confirm that luggage by identification that it is theirs. If you have a minibus and you're doing a, a multi pickup, and a multi drop off. Inquire who is leaving the vehicle first so you can put their luggage in last. What you don't want to be doing is taking all the luggage out at each drop to access some luggage at the bottom. Every licensing authority in the country will clarify that help that passengers should give to their luggage. In other words, they will say, the driver should give all reasonable assistance with passengers' luggage. The key word there is reasonable. As a matter of courtesy and good manners, unsolicited assistance with luggage is a reflection of the company's approach to providing an excellent and professional service. Unsolicited assistance, luggage, you've not asked the customer, shall you get the luggage out of the boot? You just do it as a matter of courtesy and good manners. Manual handling regulations do not give recommended weight limits for safe lifting. So therefore that implies there is no weight threshold that is considered safe. What is considered safe depends on you as a person. You are involved in the lift lifting and the situation. For example, it depends on your build, how strong you are. Depends if you've been trained in manual handling and lifting. It could depend on the risk assessment being taken. How far do you have to carry the luggage? How heavy is it? How awkward is it? Is it properly packed, etc.? Should you feel that it's not safe for you to carry the luggage or items, you can refuse to take it. You can also ask, particularly if it's too heavy, ask the passenger to help you lift the item into or out of the boot of your car. When carrying out a risk assessment, check the load, how heavy it is, that it's packed properly, that um, how far you have to carry the item, if there's any obstructions like doors or stairs, gates, etc. Exemption certificates. We've mentioned this in previous units. When an exemption certificate is displayed in the vehicle, it alerts wheelchair customers to the fact that the driver is not actually able to push that wheelchair up the ramp or lift heavy luggage. The exemption certificate has to be displayed in the vehicle. The driver is perfectly fit to drive, but not fit to do these aspects of his job. Drivers who are self-employed must take responsibility for assessing and reducing the risk to its lowest practical level. So, always assess the task. What's involved? Is there stooping, which is where you bend and bend your waist rather than your knees? Bending, similar. 
lifting, pushing and pulling. How fit are you? Individual capacity of the lifter. So your fitness level. Have you got any underlying health problems? Have you been trained? The type of load, is it heavy? Is it bulky? Is it awkward? Is it properly packed? The type of environment where loads have to be carried. Are there stairs? Are there obstacles such as bins? Is it a slippery surface you have to walk along? If you remember the acronym TILE, T-I-L-E, you should be able to remember what's involved in when you're assessing and reducing risk of injury to yourself. So TILE, the task, T. Individual, I. Load, L. Environment, E. Tile, T-I-L-E. The human spine has a number of natural curves when overextended from their normal position are prone to injury. The back can go into spasm where the muscles are trying to spec, uh, protect the, the actual spine itself. These injuries will occur due to stretching where you've not got the load close to your body. Twisting where you're twisting your waist or your torso rather than turning your feet. Stooping where you're bending your waist instead of your knees. Don't forget the kinetic lifting principle. Adopt a good posture. Bend your knees. Take a good grip of the load, bringing it close to your body and lift, keeping your back as straight as possible. No stretching, no twisting, no stooping. These actions, stretching, twisting, and stooping, are movements that the driver performs when undertaking common tasks such as carrying and stowing of luggage, fixing and removing of seats in minibuses, manhandling wheelchair ramps, and manually pushing someone up that ramp, pushing the wheelchair with the user seated in the wheelchair, securing of the wheelchair, which involves a lot of bending and kneeling, so remember the safe lifting technique, kinetic lifting. Should you be employed by the operator and have a contract with the owner or driver, you should ensure that manual handling of luggage and parcels is carried out safely. So try to avoid the need for, ha for hazardous manual handling as is reasonable possible. Assess the risk of injury from manual handling operations that cannot be avoided. Reduce the risk of injury from manual handling operations as far as possible. And should you be doing regular work like this, carrying out training in manual handling and lifting. So you may want to um, train certain staff in those aspects of the job. Aids that can help you with luggage and other items. You could use a sack barrow, which is light and portable. You get these which are telescopic nowadays and fold away to literally an A4 size. If you uh, have a lot of wheelchair customers, you consider a vehicle with electric winch. This is particularly useful for rear loading vehicles where the ramp is at the rear of the vehicle, not a side loader. You could have uh, on a large vehicle like a converted minibus, electro hydraulic tail lift which raises the wheelchair to the floor height of the vehicle and the trans the passengers are transferred safely and comfortable into the seating area of the vehicle there is no pushing involved it's simply all done with um, controls and buttons obviously you need to secure the wheelchair once in place within within, within the minibus Drivers are not obliged to transport luggage when the luggage is overweight. So you, because you could injure yourself or you can't secure it properly in your boots. So excessive or liable to create a road traffic hazard by making the vehicle unsafe. So it affects your steering if it's too heavy. Should you be able to manage to load a fairly heavy load, make sure you centralize that load and do not put it on one side of your vehicle as this will definitely affect the steering and control of your vehicle so for example you should consider the effect of heavy loads by uneven weight distribution the terms of your insurance policy if you're insured to carry such a load 
the health and safety of you, the driver, and obviously your, all your passengers due to your duty of care, and obviously endangering other road users because you can't control the vehicle because of the heavy weight. You may be requested to carry goods to and from various locations, not just passengers. We're talking about um, unaccompanied goods here. This type of work is similar to operating as a courier and may in some circumstances breach your actual licensing conditions. It could breach Carriage of Dangerous Goods Acts 1996 and any amendments there too. It could breach the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and COSH regulations. So, licensing conditions. It may say, for instance, in your licensing conditions, you are not allowed to carry fireworks. Let's get things into perspective. Should you be picking up a customer, particularly near bonfire night from the local supermarket and within her weekly shopping or his weekly shopping, there is a box of fireworks for the children, you are not going to refuse that job. However, if somebody asks you to go to a warehouse and pick up 200 boxes of fireworks operating as a courier, that is a different story you would refuse that job because it is hazardous materials. The bottom of those cost regulations, watch out for any markings on the items, any symbols. Read any labels such as handle with care, this way up, fragile, may contain liquids. Special precautions, criminals. Drivers can fall prey to petty crooks and criminals or moving illicit and dangerous goods, drug dealers, um, smugglers, etc. If a driver has any suspicions regarding the transportation of a package, he or she should contact the local police for guidance. So, should you be suspicious before you pick the item up, you would refuse the item. Should you be suspicious after accepting the package for delivery, you should contact the police for guidance. Don't forget, apart from drug dealers and smugglers, we are on alert for high alert for terrorism in this country at the moment. So should you be very suspicious about a package containing some sort of explosive, you would evacuate, evacuate your vehicle in an isolated area and contact the police for guidance. Failure to alert the police as to a suspicious package will not help your case if you are arrested for transporting dangerous goods and substances. So, let's talk about drug dealers. Some unwitting drivers have been apprehended by the police for carrying illegal goods. These are usually drug related or goods where on which duty have not been paid, so they've been smuggled into the country. I have there a cutting from a local newspaper. I've blanked out the driver's name. Although he never denied knowing about the drugs, Chief Inspector Colin Martin has warned all that cabbies to stay vigilant. He told the Nottingham Evening Post, if drivers are asked to carry a package from Nottingham to Liverpool, as this was the case, or vice versa, they need to make some inquiries about what is in it. They if they have any concerns, they have got to consider their own position. If they are caught with a controlled substance, they are most likely to go to prison. Drivers need to ask more than the cursory question to find out what is in the package. This driver was actually jailed for smuggling £200,000 worth of heroin. So, pickups. Should you be picking up from off the street, from a pub, a hotel? etc. Be very wary if you are accepting unaccompanied packages. A drug dealer would never ask for a pickup at his home address. So I've said on that newspaper cutting that you are most likely to go to prison. If you are found to be carrying drugs that uh, there's no customer in the car, you would certainly go to jail. 
You might not be charged, but you would certainly spend time at the police station until they've completed their inquiries, because they may think you, part, you are part of a drugs gang. If they found that you have been doing this on a regular basis, you would certainly go to prison. So just try explaining to the police you had no idea what you were carrying it can be very difficult. You have a right to know what you are carrying at all times. Should you be suspicious, ask the customer to show you what is in the parcel. You cannot open the parcel yourself, but ask the customer to show you. If they refuse, refuse to take the goods. You need to protect yourself. Should you be picking something up from the port or the docks, and after picking something up, you become suspicious about the items, contact the customs, as the items may be smuggled and duties not been paid on, such as alcohol or cigarettes. It's quite surprising when the authorities stop vehicles for inspection. I've put um, some information there regarding Glasgow. Recently in Glasgow city centre, 50 defect notices were issued by the police with six vehicles being immediately suspended. So, 154 private hire vehicles were also checked in the city centre and the West End, with 27 alleged offences being uh, detected. So apart from the defect notices on the vehicles, six of which were PG9Is, immediately suspension, the other offences include transportation of drugs and weapons and various road traffic violations. The whole day saw a total of 708 drivers checked by Strathclyde Police, with 111 offences detected and 22 taxis taken off the road in Glasgow. As I say, drugs possession, offences, weapons, even driving without insurance and operating without a license. Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers are not the police. They are an organisation that work alongside the police. The difference between the police and Crime Stoppers, should you phone the police, the phone call is recorded and your number is taken. Crime Stoppers, Crime Stoppers is 100% completely anonymous. So, who is in your taxi is an initiative that has been used by constabularies around the country to tap into the knowledge of taxi drivers who suspect they are giving lifts to criminals. We have ears, we have eyes, we see things, we hear things. This is in Gloucestershire here. The chief inspector said, we know that some offenders routinely use taxis and private hires to carry out their criminal activities. This could be to travel to or from a location where a crime is committed or to courier stolen property, drugs or illegal items from one place to another. We are hoping that this new publicity campaign inspires taxi drivers to use the anonymity offered by Crime Stoppers, uh, the line to pass on any information they may have about suspicious fares they have taken. There is the telephone number. I would suggest that you put that in your mobile phones should you ever need it. However, never, ever, ever put yourself at risk. We all want to live in a crime-free society where our children and families can grow up safely. So work with the police in the area to reduce your crime, but do not put yourself at risk. If that customer knows who you are, your name, where you live, for instance, it could be quite dangerous for you. Crime Stoppers is useful because it's totally anonymous. Should you have a passenger in your car who has drugs on their possession and you are stopped by the authorities and the passenger, for instance, stuffs the drugs down the back of the seat, the police are not ignorant, they will realise it as the passenger done that, particularly if it's in the rear seat and not the driver. So don't worry about that. We are talking mainly, uh, as on the previous slides, about unaccompanied packages where you would be imprisoned should you be carrying drugs, stolen goods, goods where there's no duty been paid, etc. So the operator and his staff at the base and the drivers themselves must satisfy themselves that any package to be carried and forwarded is, is legal. 
So they need to question the consigner as to the contents. The consigner is the sender, the pickup. The consignee is the receiver, the drop up. You must ensure that it's correctly packaged and labeled. So the labeling matches the information on the job that the driver has received. So he knows he's got the correct package. Ensure that it meets the regulations for the carriage of limited quantities, such as oxygen or fireworks. If the operator or drivers are using their vehicle for curry work, they should ensure, as I say, that what is carried is legal and clearly labeled. The company themselves may have a policy that gives protection to the drivers by having the customer, before any carriage, sign the company's terms and conditions of carriage. So if you're doing regular work for a particular customer and you are delivering on a company packages, it will be useful for that company to sign your terms of condition of carriage. I shall give you an example. This is what the customer would sign at the end. You, that is the customer, warrant that all goods entrusted to us for carriage have been properly and sufficiently packed, labelled and or prepared and that the goods are suitable for the carriage in the vehicle provided by our company. Two, we shall not accept or deal with any noxious, dangerous, hazardous or inflammable or explosive goods or any goods likely to cause injury or damage or any valuable or fragile goods without special arrangement in writing to us. So in other words, if it's valuable or fragile, we need to be informed so we can make the decision if we're going to carry it. As regards the noxious, dangerous, hazardous or inflammable explosive goods, we may destroy such goods or otherwise dispose of them at our discretion and at your cost. Number three. In the event of any illegal materials being discovered within a consignment passed to us for delivery, we will contact the relevant authorities, i.e. the police or the customs, as soon as, possible, as soon as appropriate without first notifying yourselves or any other party. We are going to inform on you. The terms and conditions relating to the carrying of parcels and goods will give some protection to the drivers and also the operator but does not absolve them altogether the need for scrutiny and verification of the customer. So you still need to prejudge and assess the risk to yourself and your, and your vehicle. So in summary, operators, uh, taxi drivers and private hires must take precautions when asked to deliver any packages and goods. So this is on accompanying packages again. They must reduce the risk by Question the consigner as to contents. Ask the sender what is in it. Check all labels and markings. So the labeling matches with the job you have on your screen. The markings, it may say fragile, this way up, handle with care, etc. Transport only low, only low risk items. You're not carrying anything hazardous or dangerous. Avoid known hazard areas where you know drug dealers operate. Inform the police if suspicious about a package after you've picked it up. And a, a good idea to stop any fraudulent com, com, um, claims is to ensure the customer signs a consignment or delivery note. A consignment or delivery note will have the address on it and the contents of the, of the parcel or package. Upon delivering the item, to the consignee, ask them to sign for it. This gives the driver protection because it will give the date and time that it was delivered. It will give the name of who it was delivered to if you ask them to print and sign their name. Also, it's, it will state that the goods have been received in good condition. So it stops fraudulent claims. Special precautions carrying certain products. Blood products. It's an EU directive that blood transportation and its evidence of use to patients has full traceability. 
So the driver has to be aware of emergency procedures and the paperwork involved. Blood products picked up from the blood bank must not be placed on your car seat, be transported in the boot of your car in the appropriate packaging provided by the blood bank and secured so that there is no transfer, weight transfer in the boot. The caption I have there is exactly how the box looks from the blood bank containing files of blood going to the hospital, whether that be the pathological or the surgical wards. So operators and the drivers under contract with the hospital or blood bank must ensure they are familiar with all the tracing paperwork between the hospitals and blood bank, where to sign, what copy of what page to give. Know the procedures for pick up and drop off, what, where the wards are, where the departments are, including appointed National Health Service staff addresses, label it and signatures, where they sign. Who to contact in an emergency such as a vehicle breakdown because that blood needs to get to the hospital. So should you be near the blood bank? You would contact the blood bank. They have vans and motorcyclists that could pick up the product or they will have contracts with uh, a private hire company near the blood bank. They will tend to use a private hire operator that is near the hospital to where the blood is going. So should you break down closer to the hospital, you would phone your base, pass the blood over, pass the paperwork over. You must maintain the integrity of the product during transportation. So the integrity and condition of the product must be maintained. You do not tamper with the product. That product is either being tested, the blood is either being tested, or it's actually going in to someone's body after a surgical process by a transfusion. You can imagine the implications should you interfere with that product. So maintain the integrity. That's the means, the honesty of the product. Other products that fall into this category are patients' medicines, medications, uh, mother's breast milk, where it's going to prenatal and premature baby births. Always maintain the integrity of the product during transportation. How come to? Know how to carry out lost property checks and take the appropriate steps to contact the owner. Routine checks for any lost property. Returning lost property to the owner. When checking for lost properties between the seat squabs, that is the gap between the seats, the driver should take precautions such as wearing protective gloves. On a lot of vehicles, the actual rear seats will lift up so you can see if anything has fallen down between the squab, the gap between this, the, the back of the seat and the actual seat itself. If your vehicle, the seat doesn't lift up, press the cushion down on the seat and shine a torch into the gap as well as wearing gloves. When checking underneath the driver and front passenger seat, use your torch once more and use gloves again. Things could be left behind. We're not just talking about lost property, we're talking about discarded items. A drug addict could use a hypodermic needle behind. There could be discarded food items such as cold pizza, etc., crisps, soiling. Somebody may have come into your car inadvertently with dog dirt on the sole of their shoe and it'll be on your mat underneath your seat. Someone's hygiene may not be up to the standards that we would expect. And any spittle or phlegm may have been wiped down the back of your seat. Wear gloves, take care, have special precautions. On termination of a journey, so every single job, the driver should check the vehicle for property that has been accidentally left behind. So when we say check, we mean a cursory look over your shoulder. We're not expecting you to search the vehicle, just check. At the end of shift, before going 
into your property, you should search the vehicle for any less property or discarded items. The rules are different for taxi drivers and private hire drivers. Taxi drivers, any lost property must be handed into a local police station within a stipulated time as in your license conditions or a practical time that is considered reasonable, e.g., for example, within 48 hours. You need to check your own li local licensing conditions, the bylaws, it will state there. Some councils, um, some police stations will not accept lost property from taxi drivers. You have to take it to a uh, transportation department of the local council, usually again within 48 hours. Check your licensing conditions. With private hire drivers, it is simple. Lost property must be handed into your operator, your dispatch office, where he will keep a record of that and make every attempt to find the rightful owner. So, where are private hire drivers handing in to his operator, the dispatch office? The item should be labeled and then placed in a safe, secure environment. As many details as possible from the driver should be taken so that the operator could try and find the rightful owner. One of the main things is the time that it was found. So he knows he's only going to check the jobs prior to that time and not after that time. Possible hirer's names, place of possible loss, drop off, pick up, all catalogued in the lost property record at the operator's office and signed in the presence of the driver. So the lost property record will be date, time, item, time found by which driver. This will give the driver protection if, if, and the operator if any uh, dispute arises over the return of the property. Once it is handed over to the operator, it's the operator's responsibility to keep it in a safe and secure environment. When would you tell the operator that you found an item in your car? The answer is immediately or as soon as possible. Until handing that item over to the operator, it is the driver's responsibility to, to keep it in a safe and secure environment so that it doesn't go missing or it's not damaged. Within the private hire dispatch office, any unclaimed lost property can be disposed of normally after one month from the date it was recorded in the lost property record book. So that could either be given back to the driver for his honesty, to charity, to be auctioned off, to raise money for charity, etc. As a condition of license, the private hire operator or the taxi driver has to take positive steps to trace the rightful over and return the property. Now, should you be in your vehicle and the property is found and the customer contacts you, it may be they've left a mobile phone in their car, for instance, or they've gone through the base and the base has said, yes, the driver's reported the property in the vehicle, the driver's found it. Should that customer want the property returning to their address straight away, you can charge the metered fare for the distance travel to return the goods. Should the customer be unwilling to pay such a fare, the goods will be deposited for safekeeping at the dispatch office where the customer can pick them up in their own time, which is convenient to them. Obviously, the customer will be, no, be told beforehand that a charge will be levied, whether that's a set fare or on the meter. Thank you. That completes this unit. Please review and check your understanding before moving on to the next unit, which will be the last one in the course. Thank you.